Thank you, Ken. I hope I did it right. Okay, and then I'm going, everybody, I need to mute everybody. Mute all. Okay. But you can hear me, right? Okay. So welcome everybody, good evening. I just want to give you um, a few of the up events. And um, first of all, uh, if you were lucky enough to uh, be a part of the Slachot services, they were really beautiful. I have to say, they were really lovely. Uh, I wish our sound system was better to really appreciate the beautiful voices, but it was a lovely service. So um, on Wednesday, September 16th at 11 a.m. and Wednesday, September 23rd at 5 p.m., we are going to have a shofar blowing in the parking lot. People will be lining up just like we do to get our halas. And we're going to make a big oval around the parking lot. And um, Rabbi will come out when we have a certain number of cars there. And he will show for the three different ways. And that group of cars will leave and then a new group will come out and he'll repeat that. And we should have the Jewish Journal there. Um, we're hoping to get a good picture, a nice story. Will be a Facebook live on Monday, September 21st at 12 p.m. Mindy will return on Wednesday, September 23rd at 7 p.m. for the gift of deadlines. And I am so curious as to what you mean by that, Mindy. I can't wait for that one. And on Tuesday, October 6th at 7 p.m., we're going to have Temple Beth Am's Sukkot Zoom Extravaganza. And this is something that we've been working really hard on. It's going to be a lot of fun. So we're hoping that you all attend. We did have to attach a small fee on there. We tried all summer to give you without any, but now we need to put a small amount on some of our events. And uh, the rabbi on October 7th, just the following evening, will um, have a biblical humor in honor of Simchat Torah, and that will be at 7 p.m. October 7th. So we hope that you will be able to uh, participate and be there for that. Okay, on with the show. Teshuva, or tshuva, repentance, the action of regret or remorse. Biblically, it is a call to a person to make a radical turn from one way of life to another. It's a summons to a personal, absolute, and unconditional surrendering. So how lucky we are to have a Jewish holiday allowing us to have a 10-day period of introspection and repentance, a kind of cleansing of the soul, the proverbial do-over of your life. So without further ado, I turn this event over to our fellow member and friend, Mindy Islander. So take it away, Mindy, and you need to unmute yourself, please. Oh, excuse me. Um, Mindy may be asking for some answers, um, or if you have any questions for later on, please type it into the chat for us. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. And welcome, everyone. Bruchim Abba'im. It's so nice to have you join me today in today's study session. And yeah, I'm going to try for this to be interactive. Um, I haven't tried this on Zoom yet, but if I'm doing some questions, um, asking some questions, I'm hoping that you will respond. And as Judy said, put them in the chat box. So. Um, before we begin, I'd like to actually start off with some questions for you. Uh, what do the high holidays mean to you? And how do they affect you emotionally, spiritually, intellectually? Take your time. Don't 
Don't all jump in at once. <laughs> <laughs> They're all typing away. <laughs> okay. In the meantime, I'll tell you that Irene says she's so glad to see everyone. And we're oh, glad good. to see good, good. her and everyone too. So Jane Adler says, I think of it as a new beginning. Wonderful. And it is, and by the way, and as you're typing, you know, Rosh Hashanah is head of the year. And just like our head is like the, the center, our brain is the center for, um, all of our bodily functions and our intellectual functions and it it is the foundation and what directs us so is the foundation of the new year starts us off in a good place so how we approach the high holidays helps us also direct what we're going to do in the rest of the year anybody else writing no, not at this moment okay so what let me ask you something else what do you oh here we go it's a reset for our soul and a time to let go of what doesn't serve us and embrace growth. Etan. Um, and so let me also say, ask you, what do you want to accomplish um, with this, with your prayers and with your behavior during this holiday? What kinds of changes do you want to make? Where, how do you want to uh, look inside yourself? Um, what, what is it that you want to do? Well, I'm going to just say something that I'm thinking. Okay. I'd like to erase a lot of the things that perhaps I did that I wasn't um, very proud of or whatever a new start, a clean start. Um, Heidi saying, I want to get to set some realistic goals and strive to achieve them. Perfect. Perfect. And, and you know what I think that we all do? We all want to reset. We all want to set goals because it's, it's true when, when we're making changes and change is hard, if you're not actually setting goals, realistic goals and, and interim goals to help us achieve them, it's a lot harder to, to get where we want to go. Um, okay, so here's another one. This high holiday is different than any other holiday that we've had in our lifetime, any other high holiday. We've had a few other holidays during the period of COVID, um, but this is, this is very different. So how will you prepare yourself to daven with kavana, with very focused intent, um, and, and also to feel a part of the larger community? What, what are you going to do to make it feel more like a Yom Tov and to help you connect. Because I, when I'm sitting in, in Shul and I'm with my fellow Jews uh, and we're praying, we're davening prayers that have we've heard throughout the generations, there's just an unbelievable connection that I feel going towards the past and, and heading towards the future. And, and there, this is a special challenge this year. So what, what do you feel like you would do? Oh, I see um, there's a couple other responses here. Yes, it's a good chance to reset our values with better behavior to follow them. That's from uh, Gary and Sheila Grogan. That, that's oh, uh, just a, a statement to, instead of my reading it, to have people raise their hand and unmute themselves. So, but I think we're going to keep this going here. Oh, you want to continue with the chat box. Okay. Okay. So um, again, how are you going to overcome? <laughs> how are you going to overcome the challenge this year of, um, of COVID so that you can feel connected with the community so that you can really dive in with, with this covenant, with this intent, this focused intent. There's another 
Gary and Sheila, I go to Minion every day and it doesn't matter what I wear, but for these holidays, I'm going to get dressed up. Great idea. I'm going to do the same. It's going to make me feel much more connected, like, like I'm there. What else? Any other ideas? I was going to say that um, sometimes being alone is not bad because when we're in a group, you get distracted. You see what this one's doing, that one's doing, this this one's talking, that one's talking. And maybe this way, being alone and just focusing on the rabbi and the cantor and the bima, we can really focus on our prayers and not, not and, and clue out any distractions around us, really bring ourselves to the place we want to be at. That's that right. is a wonderful way to interpret it. Um, that we can, we can truly connect and that it's, yes, it is a community um, prayer experience, but it also is going to help us with our direct connection with Hashem. Jane said that despite being home, we will still dress up and put it on our big screen TV. Art will wear his kittle. Um, it was actually, uh, I don't know, maybe it was from Jane, um, your rabbi from New Jersey. Somebody wrote, a rabbi wrote, how important it is to put on the holiday clothes, put it on the big screen, you know, to do everything as if you are actually in temple. Beautiful, beautiful. And the truth is, community can be felt in so many ways. We don't have to necessarily be sitting physically in the shoal. We can feel that community um, amongst our brethren around the world, our brothers and sisters, I should say, and, and with our shoal family as well. So, and I'm asking these questions just to highlight how active a role we need to play in engaging with Hashem and with other people and with a larger community. And also to underline how Teshuva really enables us to move forward and to grow. Okay, so we say in our prayers, Hayom harat olam. Today is the birthday of the world. Mm -hmm. But actually, Rosh Hashanah is not about the creation of world. It's about the creation of humankind. According to tradition, it is the day that Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve, were created. And for human beings, that is the beginning of this all-important journey that we're on, not creation. So Rosh Hashanah has less to do with creation, but everything to do with the way we relate to God, with other people, and with ourselves. With God, ben adam l'makom, with other people, ben adam l'chavero. Um, and so those are the relationships that we need to examine and to elevate and to grow. So as flawed human beings, we need this holiday, and it is a gift. We need the holidays and we need the process. Not, of course, that we don't do Teshuvah throughout the year, because we do, but this is a special time that we mark in the cycle of the holidays that we devote specifically to this. Now, I want to stop with you and think for a minute how people, the secular world, celebrates the secular new year. And um, think about how we celebrate the Jewish new year and compare and contrast it in our minds. Yeah, okay, there's lots of parties, there's fireworks a lot of times, there's alcohol, there's music. Not that that can't be fun. You know, I'm all for having a little bit of fun. That's great. But the contrast between the two is so stark. And, and the intent between the two holidays is also different. So I want to ask you now, what are your thoughts about the difference? What's the focus behind each one? In the secular well, there's no there's no attachment to to God. There's no attachment to God. It's it's all about the person, and not about the community or the spirit or any any even observance of a higher power. Absolutely true. Anybody else? Yes. Can you hear me, Mindy? Hey, <laughs> hey. Yeah, I, I, one of my thoughts is that for the secular new year, everyone's making um, promises to themselves. I'm going to lose 10 pounds. I'm going to, you know, clean my house more often. They're looking forward. At our new year, we're all, we're looking forward, but we're also thinking back to the past year and what we did and um, sort of atone or what, 
Yom Kippur, we atone for what we did, and we think about all the things that we did in the past. So we're always, we connect the past and the future more than in the secular. And that's beautiful that, that there is a, a, a long um, uh, process of, of, and of course that's what we do as Jews anyway, where we connect to the past, we are very present uh, where we are, and then we're looking also to the future. But it is very thoughtful, it's a very introspective, very self-reflective. Um, uh, Jane was saying that the secular New Year does have resolutions, though. Um, yeah, Etan made a statement, humankind could not be more in need of a rebirth than any time in modern history. In these dark times with the pandemic and so much hatred and division sowed. Yeah, I was also going to add that I was going to add that with the secular new year, it's definitely a lot more about, um, you know, like you were saying, just kind of just uh, partying and kind of indulging in, uh, you know, and, and uh, celebrating really more material hedonistic, uh, you know, drives more animalistic drives. Um, it's all about, yeah, exactly. Let's go party and get, crazy drunk and this that and the other and you know just it's it's a different type of a cell like of a celebration where you know it's more outward it's more you know let's all get together and you know just throw a huge party say we're going to do something good for ourselves etc cetera, etc cetera. but th you know roshana is all about introspection it's all about it's more it's more instead of a communal type of holiday, except uh, while well, we do get together for dinners, but instead of like a communal where it's about partying and all of this, it's much more uh, individualistic and personal of a holiday where we all, you know, take stock of ourselves individually and, mm -hmm. you know, try to better ourselves and forgive ourselves and forgive others and all of that stuff. So it's, there's a whole lot more of, you know, introspection and, and like um, someone else said, godliness and and meaning behind Rosh Hashanah than the secular new year which is just all about you know throwing caution to the wind you know having a blast and you know drinking and all that stuff so I like to piggyback also on what Eitan just said in that yes it is very very personal it is about our relationship with Hashem and our relationship with other people but um also don't forget that a lot of the prayers are said in the in the plural you know, Asham no Bagano, it's, it's in the plural. And, and I think that we are also very, very um, focused on our communal responsibility towards one another. And also how the Jewish people as one, as one union, as one soul, if you, if you want to get mystical of it, we're all part of one large, larger um, Jewish soul, um, that we do share the same fate. And so then we all confess in a communal way and we all... Um, take responsibility for one another. And we also know that each of our individual actions um, have an effect on the whole community, just as whatever the community decides to do has an impact on us. Right, Any the prayers are written out that way, where instead of it being, you know, it, we pray for everybody, you know, in, our, in the prayers, it's for the community because, you know, mm -hmm. as Jews, you know, the whole, you know, Kol Yisrael, Arivim Zelazeh, we're all responsible for one another. You know, one missing chain in the link will destroy the whole entire chain. So it's that whole concept of, you know, we're not just selfishly playing, praying for ourselves, you know, for, you know, we're praying through, like you said, the way it's written, for everybody else as well. Mindy, I want to just say something, and I don't know if you covered it before I jumped in. I'm having a really hard time about how I'm going to approach the holidays this year. Yeah, we actually really did. We, we actually did. We, did. We, we had a question about it. How are we going to pray with the Kavanah, and what are we going to do to make it feel more like Yonta? We did. We did. But actually, I think this is being recorded, right, Judy? So if there's any part, then anybody. Okay. okay. Um, but, but I will just kind of summarize. Um, people are going to, to dress up. People are going to, um, you know, a, a connect as much as they can. And, and, and um, I remember Heidi was saying that, that in a way, um, when you're in shul, sometimes you're a little bit distracted, but this is going to also, in addition to, you know, feeling that we're, we're still part of a community, we're, it's really helping us focus um, on our relationship with Hashem and God and really make that prayer connection. So that is a really positive way, I think, also to look at this. 
um, Judy, I think there's some other comments here. Yes. Um, well, Jane had mentioned that um, the secular new year has its resolutions. And Shady said, but their resolutions are materialistic and ours are more spiritual. And Jane responded, our resolutions are more self-focused, while Jewish focus is more on how we relate to others. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. It was it was Shavy that said that the comment. By the way, <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm chilled at mirror. <laughs> okay. So I'm also going to add something to all these very perceptive and thoughtful comments, and I'm going to say that I also can't think that all the parties in the hoopla surrounding the New Year is a kind of a way to psychologically drown out the realization that time is passing. And that as human beings, our time, at least in this particular lifetime, is limited. Um, we each have a role in God's larger plan. We're given a finite amount of time to become who we're meant to be in this lifetime. And rather than distract ourselves from this, because look, you know, when we contemplate our mortality, it's uh, a little bit disconcerting, to say the least. But we don't try to drown it out. We focus on it. We're wise enough to know that things don't just go away if we pretend that they're not there. And actually, it makes us feel how precious time is and how in God's sight, we are each all individuals and so important in his plan and so precious to God. And that we approach the Jewish holidays with humility, with wonder, with gratitude, and that we take this covenant between God and the Jewish people very seriously. So we don't try to run away. We focus and we turn it to the good. We see how joyful and how wonderful that experience can be. Okay, so now let me ask all of you, um, how do you define the word sin? What does it mean to you? And what are some examples that ordinary people might do? Some sins that ordinary people might do. So what does it mean to you? And um, how, what are some examples that you can think of that, you know, run-of-the-mill people like us or, might do. Right, you're saying sin? Sin. <laughs> what? what? Is it sin you're saying? Sin, sin. Sin. Oh, where sin. to start? <laughs> Pick your favorite. Uh, chocolate cake? <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the worst. Writing? I think mm -hmm. you know one of the worst sins is talking badly about somebody else. I think yeah, that's Lashon Hara. That's yeah. Lashon Hara. I think that's like one of the worst sins, and you know, something that I'm very conscious of: spreading rumors. That goes in that same basket. You know, spreading rumors, talking badly about other people. Can't afford to do that, especially in this day and age with all this COVID stuff going on. We can't. We can't about other other human beings that's not right i used to have this discussion with my rabbi down in florida and i if we were very close personal friends as well and if we were talking about somebody from shul for example and it wasn't really a, t a bad thing we were talking about but it wasn't necessarily a fantastic thing but it was the truth so i used to say to him but it's not Lashon Hara or Lashon Hara if, it, if you're just saying the truth about something because of everything that, if you always spoke of other people, where does it stop and where does it begin, the Lashon Hara? Do you know what I'm saying? It's, it's I mean, a very yeah, difficult say, oh, that distinction to make. It's, it's yes. a difficult distinction to make, but there, there are laws in Lashon Hara that talk about how carefully have to be even relating the truth about someone because um, you just never know how somebody's going to capture that and, and what's going to happen with it. So it, it is a fine distinction and yet we sometimes do have to talk about truth and that's for the next class. Okay, <laughs> let me know when. <laughs> um, but Lashana Ra, just to kind of add a little bit to that, I think it's probably one of the ones that we are more prone to falling into. Um, speech, look, God created the world with speech, um, and, and, and speech creates our, our uh, reality. It truly does. And um, when we do Lashonara or even listen to Lashonara, 
we're hurting three people. We're hurting the person that we're talking about. We are hurting the person we're talking to because it does damage to them and it sets up a mindset about that person. And then of course, we're also doing damage to our own souls. So yeah, I think that is a very good um, thing for us to, to be aware of. Okay, anybody else want to comment? Katie, Katie has her hand up. Oh no, I didn't, I, I spoke before, I didn't oh. put it down. Maybe I put okay. it down, hold on. Okay. Yeah, okay. I did, I, I spoke. Go ahead, Art. Um, just to, just to harken back to what you said in terms of speaking at all, Ramban prohibits the speaking even of good stuff <laughs> because it, of the effect it would have on the other individual, which may cause you as the, the, the talker uh, to cause a, a, a sin on yourself. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes, you know, praising somebody, you just never know. There's something called married I am with, like, like looking at something that, that causes a reaction in somebody else that would make them feel uncomfortable or uh, maybe even a little bit um, hurt or envious or whatever. So, yeah, it's a very, very, I mean, you can talk years about which one, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. But I think that, for, that is probably a real one of the mill problem that most people have to struggle with. I really do. Okay, um, anything else? I think uh, for me, just defining sin, it's sort of something to me, like it just doesn't feel right for my soul. I'm kind of into souls these days. And, and if you're talking about sin, whether whatever kind of, however specific you want to get, I mean, there's legal sin, but for me, it's more of a moral thing. If it doesn't feel right for my soul and I'm not doing the right thing, you know, that, that sort of gets in the category of a sin. Um, and I might interpret that differently than other people, but if it just doesn't feel right inside, that's a sin. Is it tied up with your ethical, with, with your, your ethics? Yeah, ethics, morals, things like that. Yeah, to some yeah, extent, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think kind of God, yes, you have to educate morality to people because yeah, the rationality, you can rationalize anything away. But I think that, um, God kind of installed that in us as, as a way to, to nudge us, to realize, wait a sec, this isn't right. We need to, to reshift and redirect and do something different. Okay, so um, oh, now I, I want to ask you, oh, I'm sorry, somebody I, else? I was just going to throw in a little bit more about that aspect of sin, though. Um, the sense of really just overall sin in, in a sense of a, just a topic and what it, what it really is, you know, our lives, every single one of us, every single day, every single second, especially in this dark, hard time where we can't go anywhere, do anything, and there's just so much just unease and all that. Um, but every day in our lives, we have to balance and find balance in our lives. And we end up basically having to fight the Yetzirahara with all of our might. We, which the Yetzirah and the Yetzirah Tov. The Yetzirah Tov is the good inclination and the Yetzirah is the inclination for, the, for evil or for bad. And it's hard to find that balance. And even depression is considered a, a sin. It's not a sin because we can't help it. I mean, it's, it's our chemicals, but we have to fight it because it's, it's something that is also the Yetzirah. It's anything that is, is, that is taking over our soul, like you were saying, Steve, and, and, and causing us to feel shackled and do things that aren't with um, in line with our inner core is a sin because it's, it, it ends up, you know, we're, we're, we're being fed by the evil inclination, which every human being has. There's all, oh, everyone, and we always have to fight and balance that. So that's really what sin, in my opinion, is, is, is just doing your best to always constantly fight the Yetzirahara, the inclination to do bad, which is in all of us, and, you know, we sometimes give into it, but it's most important, at least, that we catch ourselves when we're doing so. And you know what I, I beautifully put, and I want to um, add on to that, that I think, I mean, of course, God created us. So he gave us both. And um, a little bit farther on, I'm going to talk about Yitzhara and Yitzhara Tov and how the Talmudists actually looked at it. But um, I, I really think that since God gave us both, fighting and struggling with the Yitzhara actually teaches us to, helps us integrate what we're learning. Remember, 
you can always understand something intellectually, but until you really wrestle with it and you really work through it, it doesn't become part of you. So I, I, I think that this is a very, very important aspect of human beings. And, um, and it's, it's the way God made us. And I think that, that as much as we don't particularly like Yetzirah, which by the way can be used for good, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, that it's, it's part of how he created us. And it, it's the way that we really understand and learn what we need to do for our souls and in terms of reshaping and redirecting. Okay, now I want to ask you the Christian, first I'm going to talk about original sin. Um, how do you think the concept, well, I'll get there in a minute. How do you think the Christian concept of sin differs than from the Jewish concept of sin? Greatly. <laughs> In Christianity, you're born with sin, and you spend your whole life trying to improve, you know, trying to get out of sin. We're born, the Christians are born paying for the death of Jesus. We don't look at sin that way. You know, we look at it as um, a total opposite of Christianity. But but they're, always, they're always looking to atone so that they can have a good afterlife. We're more right. focused on the here and now. Exactly. I yes. always found yes. that to be the biggest difference. It, it is a huge difference. And yes, of course we think about Olam Haba, but we don't have long and um, major discussions about it. But we, we, what we do needs to m repair and, and reshape this world that we're in. Right. And, and along with what Shady said, anybody else before I go on? I was just, and I was going to comment, like how awful it is to, to spend your whole life living in sin. What like how you know, devout Christians? How could they? How could they spend their whole lives living in sin, knowing that you know, basically they're horrible people, and you have to spend your whole life making yourself better? God doesn't look at us that way. Perfect. I'm going to applaud. And so let me let me bridge for what you just said, and I'm going to say that yes, in English, Christians and Jews use the same word sin for transgressions, but. Our understanding, as we've, you've all been saying, is very, very different than the Christian one. For Christians, sin is more of a state of being. People are described as sinners or sinful. And, mm -hmm. and then there's original sin, which Jews don't believe in. Christians believe in original sin because um, after Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve uh, disobeyed God, then we were all born with this stain on ourselves. And that um, in order to be saved, you have to be baptized or believe in Jesus, etc. And so you have all of this weighing down. Um, okay. Do you it's think? Like, and we just. You have something? Okay, because. Irene. Up. Irene. Irene. A big difference is that we look for responsibility and repair instead of culpability and punishment. Beautiful, beautiful. I, I'm always struck by how positive and psychologically healthy um, the Jewish approaches towards things. I mean, I, I, we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about that in a minute, but um, I, I really do believe that we are focused, of course, we have to look back, and we also understand that there are consequences to our choices, yes, but, but we can literally reshape and reform ourselves by the, and transform what we did in the past by reshaping what we're, what we're doing in the present and the future. It can reshape and reform what we did. And by that way, also transform ourselves. So, okay. Um, did you just believe that people are inherently evil and sinful? Why or why not? I don't think Judaism is believes in that because we're all born with the spirit of God in us. So we don't believe that we're sinners. We all have the spirit of God in us. Is that okay? Is that yeah. correct? I mean, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. So no, I don't no, I don't think that Jews believe that we're inherently evil. You know, mm -hmm. in the morning service, those of you who daven regularly go to Minyan or whatever, the Elohim Shama prayer. I'm gonna read it. My God, the soul you placed in me is pure. You created it, you fashioned it, you breathed it into me, you safeguard it within me, and eventually you will take it from me and restore it to me in time to come. As long as the soul is within me, I gratefully thank you, Hashem, my God, and God of my forefathers, masters of all works, Lord of all souls. Blessed are you, Hashem, who restores souls to dead bodies. We are made in the image of God. Our soul is created, 
and through the breath of God. He breathed it into us. How can that be inherently sinful? It's part of God is in us. So if God, we're part of God. So, and, and we also know what God creates is good. We saw that repeated many times in the book of Genesis. And so people are not fundamentally evil. We don't see it that way. Now, as Eitan talked about the Yetzirah Ra and the Yetzirah Tov, we are given free will to choose between right and wrong. And we have within us that evil impulse, the Yetzirah Ra, as well as the Yetzirah Tov, the good impulse. It's up to us to master ourselves. We can choose to sully ourselves or we can choose to elevate ourselves. But here is another positive way that Judaism looks at Yetzirah. Because when I was just talking about how God gave it to us, after all, how, it couldn't be that evil. So the Talmudists actually don't think of Yetzirah as evil in the normal sense of the word or definition of evil. Yetzirah is actually our basic drives, appetites, and instincts. And if, if we're impelled by those drives alone, okay, without our souls guiding us and directing us, yep, they can be used to excess and they can be used for absolute evil. Um, but they can be used for good as well. All those instincts, they can drive us to creation, towards protection of ourselves and other people, towards relationships, towards creativity. Actually, if you think about it, that's what kind of forces us outward to engage in the world. So yes, they can be used for good as well. Now, just like yes, 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 there are a lot of things that have dual purposes in this world that can be used for good for evil. Let's, let's talk about a knife, as simple as a knife. You can carve a beautiful sculpture with a knife, right? You can use it for surgery, but you can also use it to maim and to kill. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's like anything else. We need to use our souls to direct us and to guide us. It's the same thing with our personality characteristics. Here's another healthy way to look at it. You know, we're all born with certain tendencies, right? Certain um, flaws, temperaments, et cetera. And they're not necessarily inherently good or bad in and of themselves. As a matter of fact, you can think of it this way. God gave us these particular tendencies in in the measures that we have them for a reason. Um, he knows what aspects of our soul need working on and which ones need to be challenged and repaired. And working on these particular characteristics that we have are going to help us overcome and stretch and grow our souls. So there's a method to God's badness. He gave them to us for a reason so that we can wrestle with them and, and master them and work with them and then become better people in the process. I think that's a beautiful way to look at our flaws, don't you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, let me ask you, those characteristics can be used for good or for, for ill as well. Can you think of a, an example of a character trait that could get, either get a person into trouble or could elevate him or her if they used it right? Your voice. Huh? I said your voice. You can really kill somebody with words or absolutely elevate them with words absolutely a very strong and powerful tool honesty as well honesty could be honesty could be good honesty could be very true. destructive <laughs> don't be too oh, honest <laughs> oh, oh i only tell the truth okay but you know what sometimes truth can be very very painful and and right. if not done with love um it can be very destructive very good examples. Anybody else? Oh. Anybody answer? Anybody else? Okay. So I I'm have to take it. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. I think having a trait where you talk and share news about people, you can be a gossip, or when somebody is in need or ill. You can be telling people that know them so that they can reach out and help that person. So there's two ways you can use that trait. It's beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, and, and while talking to other people and sharing your feelings, it, it, it depends how you use it. If, if you're completely self-absorbed and, and you're dumping all over somebody, that's not gonna be good. On the other hand, it can help you heal. It can help you move forward. It can help you know that somebody really hears you and understands you. 
So here's another one. Let's say somebody is a warrior. They tend to kind of be a little bit on the anxious side. So they can tie themselves all up in knots, right? And feel parallel, paralyzed with worry. On the other hand, they could use this and, you know, they're pre-planning and they're thinking, you know, this could happen and I'm going to plan and I'm going to be a little bit proactive. And, and if, if something like this should happen, then I'm going to do as what, whatever I can to be ready for it. So there's an example where you've got a, a personality characteristic or a trait and you can use it for, for good or for ill. Here's another one. Somebody is, you know, they're short tempered. They're born with a short temper. And, and they could either fly off the handle and explode uh, onto other people, or they could use that trait to cultivate patience. Oh, I'm feeling angry. Let me, let me put some perspective in this. Let me reframe this a little bit. Mm -hmm. Or they could channel that anger into righteous anger so that they can use it to improve right or wrong, see something that, that, that needs to be fixed and repaired and healed, and then they're going to use it that way. Okay, so I'm going to summarize so far, and then I'm going to continue. So, so far we've said people are not inherently evil or sinful, and they got what the soul that God created and placed within us is pure. We need to learn self-mastery to balance out the good and evil impulses, and that those impulses can actually be put in us for a reason so that we can um, grow and stretch our soul and, and make repairs where there might be some difficulty or problem. We also learned that our midot, our character traits, are not intrinsically good or bad. And it really just depends on how we use them. Um, and also, we don't try to sublimate um, our awareness that time is passing. We know that we're fragile and mortal people. And we don't try to just put a Band-Aid on it and cover it up with partying and drinking all night but we feel privileged to recognize how precious this time is and how precious and important we are to God in his Lord. And that um, each, each moment that we have is precious and that we need to use it. Um, okay. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about dogma because once we're into comparing Christianity and Judaism and then maybe some other religions as well. Um, Jews don't have to pass a litmus test where you know, we either believe in a specific rigid dogma or we're not Jews and, or we're not saved. Other religions do have that. That's another, you know, they talk about Jewish guilt. Look at how religion, our, our, our religion is actually on the contrary. We don't, we're not riddled with guilt. And, and everything else help, helps us propel us forward as opposed to keeping us stuck in, in, in a rigidity. Okay, so we also don't happen to believe that the olam haba, the world to come, is only reserved for us. Some faiths believe that if we don't accept something, um, then we're gonna go to hell. We believe that all righteous people have a place in the world to come. And they don't have to be Jewish and they don't have to accept a certain thing. Yeah, okay, maybe they have to follow the laws of Noah, the Noahide laws, the basic laws of, of civilization, but they don't have to, you know, uh, agree with a specific dogma. If you're righteous, if you're a good person, if you're following the laws of Noah, you have a place in the world to come. Mm -hmm. Now tonight I'm going to, somebody has something to say? Okay. Um, I'm going to zero on in two Hebrew terms, two of the Hebrew terms that, that are used for sin. One is called Avera, and the other one is Chet. And those two terms actually give us a, a gift of fluidity. Now, what do I mean by fluidity? Avara comes from the term avor, which is crossover. Okay, so you cross over the line with your behavior, cross back. You have an opportunity to cross back. The other term chet, and it's an archery term. It means missing the mark. So you aimed, you missed, Try again, aim again. Maybe you'll get closer to the bullseye this time. So now I'd like some feedback from you about how these particular Jewish concepts of sin might be helpful from a psychological point of view. Why is that a healthy way to approach sin? Avera, you crossed, cross back. Chet, you missed the mark, aim better. Why is that a, a, a healthier way to approach sin? Gives you a chance to uh to do better. 
it's not just cut and dry. You failed or you, you stepped over the line. That's it. You're out. No, we can, we can, we can have another chance. It Absolutely. Yeah. It eliminates the failure, the feeling of failure, because you can always do self improvement. And it shows that no one is perfect. And it shows that no one is perfect. That's right. Absolutely. Okay. So, so oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. What we I, was just gonna, I was just going to say, it shows that no one's perfect. So you, always you don't have, have to feel like a failure. You, you know, you, you, um, nobody's perfect. And, and, and it does like Marlene's, you know, much more of an optimistic way of looking at something. Okay. So, um, now let me ask you about how feeling like a sinner or being inherently sinner could affect one psychologically. Excuse me, could affect what? How could feeling like a sinner, you know, you're a sinful, you're sinful, you're a sinner, you're, you're, how could that affect you psychologically as opposed to the, um, the other uh, Jewish concept of sin? I mean, it sends you down a spiral of guilt and then you, you end up just worse and worse and worse and beating yourself up more and more and more and never get out of it if, if you just think, you know, only that about yourself. Um, and so you have to realize that you know, every day is a new day and you can always, you know, you, you just because you've done some horrible things doesn't mean that you have to keep ever doing them again. And you, there's always, you can always change all that stuff. So it's like, you have to try to feed yourself those um, thoughts too, because if you only sit there thinking, I'm a sinner, I'm a bad person, I'm horrible, I'm this, I'm that, then you're just going to keep doing worse things because it, you're just, it's going to fester more and more poison and more hate for yourself in, inside. So absolutely absolutely perfectly yeah jane oh wait unmute yourself jane okay i think uh it kind of parallels the right way hopefully that we raise our children when they make mistakes <gasps> and do things, we don't say you're a bad boy you're a bad girl we say what you did wasn't the right thing to do. That was bad. But you're still a good person, so you have that opportunity to do the right thing. That's a good distinction, Jane. Not everybody thinks that way. But that's a absolutely, very absolutely. good distinction. Mm -hmm. Can I go back and re-raise my kids? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Marlene. <laughs> may not want to. No, I, I don't have the strength. <laughs> no. Okay, so as you've all so beautifully put, each approach has a very different effect on a person. The first one is redemptive. You did wrong, correct it. You cross the line, cross back. You missed the mark, aim again. You have imperfections, take the characteristics that God imbued you with purposefully, and then use them for the develop your own development and to help other people. The second one is much more static. You're by nature a sinful creature. You're trying to be good and you're fighting an uphill battle. It's hard not to want to just throw up your hands in frustrations and to get stuck in self-recrimination and guilt. You starting to see a trend here? Mm -hmm. The very terminology that we use to designate sin des demonstrates that we don't have to be weighed down by intractable guilt, self-recrimination, self-denigration. We don't have to feel worthless just because we made mistakes. We don't have to become hopeless that we're this horrible person and th th there's just no way to dig ourselves out of this. The guilt that we feel, and by the way, guilt can be good. This kind of guilt that we feel in Judaism is not disempowering. It's not the kind, like Eitan said, where we become depressed and stuck. Mm -hmm. It's healthy guilt. It's the kind that pushes us forward so that we can make the changes that we need to make to make our lives better. Right. Finally, we're not weighed down by this rigid dogma, which actually is a pass-fail proposition. And frankly, I'd like to be graded on a curve if you don't mind. I don't want to be pass-fail. <laughs> okay, um, summing this up in this section. Um, how are we doing with time? Because I have a little bit more to go. Okay. okay, so if you if you believe that people are basically bad or sinful, then we're all fighting a losing battle against human nature to reform ourselves. 
But if you believe that God imbued within us a soul, which is in its essence pure, then it is our behavior, which is in question. I think it was Jane that said that, right? Um, and not our essential being. I'm going to say it again. God imbued a, a soul that's pure. So it, 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 with that attitude, it's our behavior that is in question and not our essential being. It means that we're still worthy and there's hope for us. All we need to do is focus on improving our attitudes and our behavior. Okay, teshuva. Teshuva is translated as repentance, but the actual word for repentance in Hebrew is charata, regret or remorse. It means that we feel remorse, decide to turn over a new leaf, and behave in completely different ways. We reform ourselves, and all that is a good and necessary part of what we need to do every day, and on the high holidays especially, but teshuva is a little bit different. Teshuva means, anybody know? Return, coming back. Return, return. So, okay, I'm gonna ask you, what are we returning to? Being a better person. Being a better person. Being, being closer to God's image. Being closer to God's image. Oh, you guys are so great. Anything else? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> yeah, you are. <laughs> Marcia said being closer to Hashem. Being you know, closer to close. Hashem. Yes, yes. So we're returning to our souls, which I'm just going to kind of sum up what you said, to which are a reflection of God and his goodness and exposing <clears throat> our best selves. We're returning to a path of righteousness and goodness. We're returning to God. All of those mm -hmm. involve a beautiful process, not a static, okay, I'm beating my chest and I'm, I'm this horrible person and I'm going to punish myself. No. But we do we're beat our chest. We are. We, what? We do what, beat what our chest. Yeah, you're right. What I meant is, <laughs> no, like I know. Hair, where, where some people actually, they, 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 they beat themselves and, until they're, they're, they're right. bloody in some, some, some cultures. Yeah, no, we do beat our chest. Sorry, you're right. Um, but, um, okay, so now what's, what's the difference between returning then and repenting? Return. Yes. In repentance, you, uh, I'm sorry, in, in re return, you actually make a move from uh, an Avera to uh, uh, Yetzir Tov. But uh, in the uh, repentance itself, hmm, I lost my track, I'm sorry. It's okay, it happens, happens to me all the time. <laughs> okay, so you know what, repentance, it's a step-by-step -step process. We, we acknowledge- Oh, oh yeah. So no, I, I just wanted to say that repentance is just feeling badly about something that you may have done. And return is changing your behavior to go back to the where it should be. Okay. Makes sense. Active. It makes sense. Uh, mm -hmm. Somebody else? Okay. With repentance, you're acknowledging and regretting what you've done. By the way, Maimonides has, ooh, what is it, four or six? Somebody correct me. He has very specific steps that you have to take for, for real sincere apologies and repentance. But you have to acknowledge and regret what you've done. You got to take responsibility for it. You have to ask for forgiveness. And by the way, that's got to be heartfelt and sincere, not the stupid apologies that we hear today. Like, oh, I'm so sorry that you, you're feeling this way. Or I'm so sorry that you're taking it this way. That's not an apology. Real apology is... I did wrong. I'm taking responsibility for it. I feel terrible about it. And I want to make sure I'm not going to do this again. So you're making amends. That's another step. And you're taking steps to never repeat that behavior again. And of course, it's in Jewish tradition, it's not good enough to just ask God for forgiveness. If we've wronged another person, we got to go to that person. Three times, right? Three times. Yes, yes. You have to, because they could say no, and I don't forgive you, but you have to go back three times. Perfect. Beautiful point. And then if they don't, okay, then, then it's on them. You, you know, yeah, you then don't, you forget it. Then you can write them. Right, 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 right. <laughs> and a shanta on them. A shanta on them. Okay, so 
Um, I think that I personally think that teshuva is a broader is broader than that. I think that repentance takes place within the framework of teshuva, as we discussed before. The soul God gave us in its original state, state and essence, it's pure and it's good. And when we participate in, in teshuva, we're returning to our soul's essence. We're going back to our divine roots and exposing them as our true nature and our true character. Um, what prompts us to want to return? What, what, what is calling us to want to return or, or even to do repentance? Harata. What's making, what's, what's prompting us to want to do it? It's your ethical, again, I'm going to say it again, your ethical, uh, I don't know, maybe upbringing or, it's the ethics of your life. You want to strive to be the best that you can be. Best meaning the most ethical, the most honest, the most kind, whatever, however you most define it. The most godlike, most yes. The best that we can be, the, God, the best that God created us to be, to, to, to be most divine, absolutely, the most big godlike. So, you know, a very, very low level of, of ethical understanding of morality is, okay, I'm going to do something so I don't get punished, or I'm afraid of getting punished, or for well, some type of retribution from God. No, 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 we don't do it for that reason. We're, we're doing it because we're responding to God's call to walk in his path, to walk in his way. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, you know, if we want the gems of our soul to shine brightly, then we got to clear away all the debris of all the behavior that's not reflective <coughs> of our high level, not the best of who we can be. So we got to, you know, work at that. We got to clear away the debris. We got to polish it. And, and we polish it by performing mitzvot and, and, um, and, and doing what we can to help our other people and also to be good to ourselves. Let's not forget that. Sometimes we don't treat ourselves as well as we treat other people, and that's important too. So um, repentance is, I think, kind of a practical means to achieving that broader teshuva, return, to return to who we truly are, to expose who we truly are. And isn't that a beautiful way to think of it? Instead of like fighting an uphill battle that we're really uh, these sinful, horrible creatures, and, and it's, 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 it's going against our true natures to, to be um, good and kind, no, we're saying that it's actually going to our true essence. We're uncovering who we really are by being good and kind. Okay. One um, can we go over just a little bit? Yeah, Judy, sure. can we go over just a tad? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to just review some of the ground that we've covered together. We thought about the difference between the intent of the secular New Year versus the Jew Jewish New Year and how that impacts what we do. We discussed the Jewish concept of sin and compared it to the Christian one, and also understanding that Jews don't believe in original sin. We don't believe that we're sinners or in a state of sin. If we cross over the line, we can cross back. If we miss the mark, we can aim again. And we don't have to be stuck in this state of self-recrimination, unhealthy guilt, and stagnation. We have free will to choose the, the Yetzirah to over the good impulse, over the Yetzirah, mm -hmm. the evil impulse. But we also understand that the evil impulse is not necessarily, um, you know, a, a bad thing. God did give it to us after all. It, it, it can be seen as our basic impulses, drives, um, appetites, and um, even they can be used for good as long as we allow our souls to guide and direct us. Um, it's the same thing with our midot or our character traits. They're also not inherently good or bad. It's, it's what we do with them. Um, we reviewed the meaning of both teshuva and repentance and how they differ. And, um, and so I want to ask you the, the, the next thing. Um, what would life be like without the opportunity of teshuva? And, 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 how, how is it, and how also does, does our discussion of teshuva now change your understanding of the process? Maybe I should ask that first, the question first. How does our discussion of teshuva change your understanding of how you view the process? I think that um, without that, there's no way back. If this, you could always 
become a better person. You could always do better. And as long as you have the desire, uh, and this is a beautiful holiday because we have the opportunity. If, if you're not doing it, all of a sudden Hashem is saying, okay, well, now here's your chance. And it's just, it's, it's like the joy of Shabbos. Every week we get a holiday. And it's fantastic. You don't have to work. You can just hang out with friends. You can go to temple. You could pray. It's it's just it's a beautiful thing. Well, so is so is the holiday. So is this. And and actually, the the, the tone of of Rosh Hashanah it, it it can be actually very celebratory, very wonderful, very um, exhilarating. I mean, Yom Kippur is a little bit more solemn, more, but it's also very awe-inspiring, but the tone is a little bit different. Um, so it's very, very beautifully put about um, how, how we all need to return. And, um, and uh, what, what, about, what about life without teshuva? Static, very static, I think. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Nothing to strive towards or think about. Never changing, never changing. And by the way, you could you could also say, if you're staying in one place, it doesn't mean that you're staying in one place. You're moving backwards. So yeah, it's very static. There's no opportunity for growth. There's no opportunity to move from one point to the next mm -hmm. point. Anybody else? Okay, I'm, I'm going to also say that. Uh, as you said, I'm going to summarize it, that it's truly a gift from God to Shiva because it gives us the, that opportunity to reshape and restore and renew ourselves. And, and it's a path towards self-respect and towards joy. And, you know, we'd never be able to carry the burden of our imperfect lives if we couldn't do Teshuva and Harata. Mm -hmm. There's no way, there's no other way that we could, we could bear, bear ourselves. I mean, we would be so... Either we would have to have no conscience or we would be so um, um, sad and depressed and, and maybe even self-destructive. We couldn't move forward. Yeah. So, um, and just to know that there is a God, that God is waiting for us to return. Come, children, come, come home to me. And he's there to help us along the way. He's there to help us along the way. And, you know, um, we're still in a law. We're not quite at Rosh Hashanah. There's a saying that, during the month of the law, as we're, we're trying to elevate ourselves and we're trying to, you know, be very introspective and think about things, that God is very close to us. God is walking in the fields. Of course, by Rosh Hashanah, he's, he's on the throne. He's king. That doesn't mean that he's not close, but he's so, he's so near us now. And um, we can still ask him to hold our hand. You know, we, we need some hand holding when we're doing this, right? So... Um, in addition to looking towards one another to help us, and, and we can be a real help towards one another, by the way. Um, and and that, that part, that aspect of Rosh Hashanah is important. And, and, and um, Yom Kippur, the Yom Yamim Nora'im. So, okay, so um, I think that, that we've, we've come full circle. We really do understand that Teshuva is a gift, that these holidays are a gift, that they, they fill us with joy and not necessarily self-recrimination. Certainly we have to understand and take responsibility for what we do, but it helps us become more divine to fulfill what God's purpose is for us. Now, mm -hmm. I'm gonna ask a few questions. You don't have to um, answer them out loud and, and feel free to come up with your own list if you'd like, but these are just some thought questions for you to think of while I'm going through them. What strengths do you have that you can enhance that will help you in terms of this journey that we're on? What areas would you like to work on? What aspects of your life need healing? How can you help somebody else heal? What would you like to devote your time and energy toward? Who might need to forgive you who might you need to forgive, living or dead? What are your hopes? What life lessons have you learned this year? And again, as I said, if you have any other questions that you might want to put down for yourself as, and, and look through, feel free to do that in, you know, in your own time. 
So in closing, Pirkei Avot, chapter 3, verse 7, relates that when ten sit together and are occupied with Torah, the Shekhinah rests among them. I want to thank you for the opportunity to engage in Torah with all of you tonight. I want to wish all of you a sweet, healthy, and happy new year. And I pray that it's going to be a year of healing on all levels for everyone throughout the world, physical and spiritual. And I want to say Shana Tova. Thank you, Mindy. Thank you, Mindy. It's great. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. By the way, Mindy is my Mahatana. Thank you, Mindy. This is my Mahatana stuff, just to let you know. And Eitan is my son. Oh, welcome. He's married to my daughter. I'm glad you could be here this and evening. Carly, Carly's not on. Carly, Carly is um, Marlene's um, daughter and Eitan's um, wife and my Kalati. My Kalati. Oh, cool. The whole family. The whole yes, family's here. Yeah, Carly is oh, putting so our, nice. our seven we, weeks. No, Eitan spoke with words so of wisdom. So yeah. Cindy, you're so smart. Oh, my God. It's amazing. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> No, really. We'll have to talk. <laughs> Thank you, Mindy. I have to say, it's a <laughs> Thank you, Mindy. Um, um, Thank, you, Mindy. Thank, you. Thank you. Nice to Good see night, you everybody. all. See you next week. Yeah. Good night, everybody. And that's all bye. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah, Mindy. Thank you. This was valuable. This was valuable insight. Thank you very much. I do have a question. Yes, yes, yes. Um, we talked about differences in Christianity and Judaism, certain things. I have often wondered, um, it, forgiveness. When you hear people um, in a courtroom, um, and, and they're Christian people who uh, will turn to the murderer of their family member and say, mm -hmm. I forgive you, you know. I, I, I wonder about that a lot. And um, I know that holding anger and hate is not healthy. I understand that those are things you need to release. But do these people actually forgive people who have done such horrific things? I, I just marvel at that. I don't think I could. I, I you know, it, I don't, I wish the rabbi were here. Um, but what I will say is that there are some things that are in our purview to forgive and other things that are not. And if we don't want to harbor this type of horribly corrosive pain, um, where we personally can't forgive, I truly believe in saying, God, here, I can't handle this. I'm going to give this to you because I don't want to carry it. Um, but, but like, for instance, the Holocaust, I'm going to go to the extreme. That's not our right to forgive those people. Uh, that is beyond our purview. That is beyond our ability or, or um, that's not within our realm. We're not even allowed to do that. That's not, that's not up to us to forgive something like that. But I really, really would like to hear the rabbi's take on that. I really would. But that's my take. Yeah. I wonder if it's a true feeling or that they have or it's just, I, I don't know. It, it's just, I, I've always questioned that, you know? Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Mindy. This yeah, was terrific. I'm so looking much. forward to next week. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Me too. Me too. And I'm Paige, sure. And by the way, I'm, I gotta say, um, the, the people are so, um, the, the comments were so wonderful and so on point. And, um, I was just so enjoyed. I so enjoyed the participation of, of the people. Oh, good. Who yeah. No, that yeah. went well. And I will tell you that it worked okay when people just spoke. Um, yeah. We did not have a great experience the first time. And so we decided not to do that. But it worked well. And it's better yeah. to hear the voices, I think. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think so too. I think so too. But we'll do that next week. Okay, great. Thank you. I hope, I hope a few more people will jump on. I think, what did we have, 17? We had 20. Like at, we had oh, 20. 20 at the most, yeah. Okay, yeah. you know what? That, that's, that's good. That's a start. Oh, that's absolutely. Good. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Okay, have a good evening. Thank you, you too. Bye-bye. Bye now. Bye.